WBOB at NBC4 in Columbus, Ohio. This is NBC4's The Spectrum with Colleen Marshall. He is brash, he is confident, he is divisive, and he is back. Welcome to The Spectrum. I'm Colleen Marshall. Republican U.S. Senate candidate and former treasurer Josh Mandel came out swinging this week, blasting Governor DeWine for failing to reopen Ohio and remove the mask mandate. Please note, Mandel told me that DeWine acted on bad math from former health director Dr. Amy Acton, saying she wrongly predicted that Ohio would have 62,000 COVID cases a day. I checked. That is not accurate. In April, Acton said COVID was peaking at 1,600 cases a day. And if Ohio had failed to act, then it could have faced 62,000 cases a day. She and DeWine claim masks are working. Scientists and doctors agree. Josh Mandel does not. Just because the left wing media says that she's an expert or a scientist doesn't make her faulty predictions wrong. And unfortunately, Governor DeWine based all these shutdowns on her bad math. And it, it was dead wrong to shut down family-owned businesses, family-owned restaurants and schools. But then he let Walmart and Target and Costco stay open. I mean, it's just dead wrong. I mean, what DeWine did was he trampled on the freedom and individual liberty of families throughout the state. I interviewed a doctor who heads the Ohio Wexner Medical Center just about a week ago who disagrees with any plan for a massive removal of the mask mandate. Uh, you know, he's not a politician. He's a doctor uh, who deals with these communicable diseases. Are you saying he's wrong, too? Well, look at the comparison between Florida and Ohio. You know, Governor DeSantis went the opposite direction of Governor DeWine. They're both Republicans. He allowed businesses to stay open. He didn't have all these big hand of government mandates. And the numbers between Florida and Ohio weren't any different. I mean, when, when Mike DeWine put in place the, the mask mandate on July 24th of last year, he said, this is gonna save lives and, and bring the numbers down. By November 13th, the numbers in Ohio had skyrocketed. And so like, just because an expert calls themselves an expert, it doesn't make bad math Good math. You are running for the United States Senate, and we also now know that the former Republican Chair Jane Timken is running. You are both Trump Republicans here in Ohio. He carried this state. Do you anticipate that he's going to endorse one of you over the other? I'd be honored to earn President Trump's endorsement and support. Uh, I consider myself a Trump warrior and a constitutional conservative. Uh, back in 2016, when Jane Timken and others were with John Kasich to the bitter end, I was the first statewide official in Ohio to support President Trump, then candidate Trump, even when a lot of these squishy establishment politicians were jumping ship when the tapes came out in, in fall of 16, I stuck with President Trump. In 2020, uh, I was part of this small group nationally called the Trump 500. Uh, those of us who raised over 500,000 for his reelection, I was involved in signing a letter uh, with veterans. You know, I'm a Marine Corps vet, did a couple tours in Iraq to support President Trump on veterans issues. And so this is all about standing up for the America first agenda. And listen, Jane is a flip flopper. Uh, she has already started flip-flopping on issues. And you know, I think she checks how the wind is blowing before me, she makes decisions. And what I check is my core values. Uh, I have core values. I believe this country was founded and grew strong based on Judeo-Christian values, not radical Muslim values. I also believe very strongly uh, in the Constitution and the God-given rights and freedoms that we as Americans have and cherish, and I will fight for those in Washington. I'm not in this to make friends in Columbus or make friends in Washington or get invited to cocktail parties. I'm in this to stand up for our liberty, for our freedom, and for our constitutional rights. You made quite a splash at CPAC uh, a week or so ago. Do you think that that far-right agenda being pushed by CPAC will carry over in the general election here in Ohio? Listen, my positions and my policies they're not based in politics, they're based in belief, what I believe in. I'm pro-life, I'm pro-gun, I'm pro-Trump, and I believe in the Constitution. And if anyone wants to get in my way, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat or liberal media, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to charge right through them. I'm not going to allow squishy establishment Republicans in Washington to twist my arm. And, and frankly, Colleen, I know there's going to be a day when I get pulled into that back room, that 
smoke filled room and they're going to try to put pressure on me. And I'm just going to look them in the eye and say, listen, you can't push me around. I've been through tougher stuff than this. But if you are elected a United States Senator, you will represent all Ohioans, not just far right Ohioans. You will represent everyone in this state. Are you saying you will only represent those who agree with you and the way you are aligned? I will proudly represent every single Ohioan in the state. And one of the reasons why President Trump won Ohio by such a high margin is because he, didn't, he not only had Republicans and independents voting for him, but there were a ton of Democrats throughout the state of Ohio that voted for the President Trump America First agenda. Uh, and listen, that's what I'm gonna advocate and lead on as well. Being tough on the economic cheating coming out of China, that's, what, that's one of the reasons why so many Democrats voted for President Trump is because he stood up against the economic cheating from China. One of the other reasons why so many Democrats, uh, in addition to Republicans, voted for President Trump is because he was tough on immigration. He said, listen, we're going to put Americans at the front of the line, not illegal immigrants. And so as a United States Senator, I'm going to stand up for those same ideals. The American Rescue Plan, a $1.9 trillion stimulus package, is making its way through Congress, could be signed into law by the president next week. It's one of the biggest spending bills in American history. I talked about it with two Central Ohio House members, Republican Steve Stivers, Democrat Joyce Beatty. We have consulted with economists. We have heard from people like Janet Yellen, who all have said it is better for us to go more and to go bold now. And think about it. Giving those dollars to those families who are still in need now, what do they do? They spur the economy. They go out and they buy food. They buy things for their family. So the dollars go back into the economy and you help people who are in need. It also allows people to be able to not only help the economy, but people to go back to work for our children to have the things that they need. And many of these things are because of COVID-19. It's not just a healthcare pandemic. It's because of the economic reckoning on our society. It's because of the injustices, whether that's housing or the environment. So all of this package is a part of keeping people safe and healthy. If it's focused on relief uh, of people in the pandemic and uh, helping fight the pandemic, you only 8% of the money, it's almost a $2 trillion bill, $1.9 trillion, and only $160 billion goes to actually fighting the pandemic. Steve Stivers is one of the House Republicans counting on Republicans and moderate Democrats in the Senate to cut from the stimulus bill what he calls pork. Now, I understand economic relief is important, too. And then there's some other issues, aid to the states and things that are unrelated to actually fighting COVID. But I'd like to see us thin it down a little more. I'd like to be able to support it when it comes back from the Senate, and I'm hopeful that they do their job. I know Joe Manchin's been talking about thinning it down because we've already spent $4 trillion on this. In an effort to win support from the GOP, President Biden agreed to lower the income threshold for the $1,400 check to $75,000 per individual, down from $100,000. Most Democrats agreed. Obviously, I wanted to make sure, as most of my colleagues who supported and voted uh, for this, that we make sure that people get the most that they can to make them whole, to stay in their homes. You know, we don't want people evicted. We don't want people losing their homes. That's why we put forbearances for mortgages. That's why we put dollars in our other relief packages to keep people in their homes and to give individual uh, relief. So we need to make sure that the people get the relief that they need. And I'm not saying I don't want to spend any more money. I just want to make sure that money is targeted to the people that need it. Congressman Stiver is hoping he can win House and Senate approval for a bill to provide support dogs for America's veterans who suffer from PTSD. More on that at NBC4i.com. And up next, another mission to support troubled veterans through the lasting legacy of 26 young men from Lima Company who went off to war and did not come home. 
I'm in the rotunda of the Ohio State House, and you may want to pay a visit here this week as well to see this remarkable exhibit. It's known as the Eyes of Freedom. A local artist, Anita Miller, painted these life-size portraits of young men, 26 of them, who all died in a single deployment of Lima Company back in 2005. The youngest, Christopher Dixon, was only 18 years old. The oldest, Staff Sergeant Anthony Goodwin, was 33. These were dads, they were brothers, they were uncles. And then on weekends, they were Marines. Stephen Cook was a medic with Lima Company for six years. But during the deployment in 2005, he was still taking field hospital training. So Travis Youngblood took his spot. Travis had a, a very young son at the time that he, he passed away and a daughter that he never met. Um, but, you know, Travis was that individual that said, I want to go make the world a better place for my, for my son and for my daughter. Travis Youngblood is one of 26 Lima Company members who will never grow old. Each of them left behind loved ones who will never be the same. One of the things I like to tell people, and I'll share with you, is that never be afraid to tell a parent uh, something that they don't know about their child because it's the only new things that we'll ever know. So it's important. Any parent who sends a child to the military yeah. knows this is a possibility. Yes. But in your heart, you don't really think it's a possibility. No, you don't. Um, it was that way for my wife and I. I mean, never one day did we ever think for a minute that he wasn't coming back. Not for one moment. And when we got that call and the military showed up at the door, we didn't really have a clear, unfogged thought for a year after that. But Jim knows his son is still serving in a different way. A lot of veterans that have been hurting since the Vietnam War or even Korea War uh, come and see this and it, it has a definite impact on them. As the exhibit traveled the country, veterans started sharing stories of pain, thoughts of suicide, like a Minnesota veteran, Brian Zimmerman, who says the exhibit saved his life. And he made a beeline for the door. He didn't want to have anything to do with this exhibition. Uh, we were able to catch him and kind of ask some questions. He ended up staying, you know, not only the rest of that day, but he was there for two more days with us, spending time with the exhibit. Zimmerman became the model for this bronze sculpture, The Silent Battle. And the exhibit now links veterans with support services. Straley was seriously injured in a roadside blast that killed six of these men. He now travels the country with the exhibit, honoring the men who didn't come home. What do you think they would think of this exhibit? You know, I, I hope, uh, I really hope that they're proud of what we're doing, uh, proud of me for, for being here and kind of being the, the leader of, the, of this mission. Many of our men that came back from Lima Company on that deployment, we've been living for them ever since. This is our 325th event in our history, and ironically, Lima Company was the 3rd Battalion, 25th Marines, so Lima Company 325 is what they were often called, and uh, it's, it's fitting for us to be not only surviving 2020, but really stepping up going forward with this guy and, you know, reemerging in 21 with a lot of more work to do to catch up. If you would like to see the Eyes of Freedom in person, this exhibit will be here at the State House until this Thursday, March 11th. It is free and obviously open to the public. When we come back, our roundtable is going to talk about the steps forward this week in the battle against COVID. We'll be right back. In our roundtable this week, we have back with us Republican strategist Terry Casey, Democrat Lou Gentile, and the rollout for the COVID vaccine moved into a new stage this week, 60 and above. Some more professions are being covered. Are you optimistic? And do you think that the criticism that Governor DeWine is getting, we heard it earlier from Josh Mandel, about not yet lifting the restrictions is valid? I'm going to start with you, Terry, because since you're in his party. 
Well, I think the governor's doing very well, and my prediction is by April, no April Fool's joke, as the vaccines are very easily available and people are realizing that Ohio steered the right course. We didn't go too far one way or too far the other way. And if you remember a year ago, our governor in Ohio was a leader in saying, hey, we might not be able to have NCAA tournaments and sports, but we're gradually ratcheting back as we're going to see later this spring, particularly in the summer and the fall. So we might not have 109,000 people in Ohio Stadium, but there'll be a good crowd cheering on the Buckeyes. And Lou, we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel, aren't we? Yeah, and I think um, President Biden is doing a great job uh, just urging caution and really telling states who are lifting these restrictions that they're not doing the right thing. I think it's important that uh, we see presidential leadership. We're seeing that now out of President Biden. We had this American Rescue Plan, which I think is vital uh, for economic relief, but also to help contain uh, the pandemic and get vaccines in the arms of, of Americans. So a lot, a lot of ways left to go yet still here. And I think it's important that we have leadership at the national and state level to make sure people are still diligent. You know, the president also talked about being willing to roll back the, the income level, the threshold for getting the stimulus money. So do we think that this is a sign that maybe there is a, a move towards some compromise on Capitol Hill, Terry? Well, I think there's some hope because it made no sense. I mean, I would love to get a big check from the federal government, but to be honest, what Republicans have been saying all along, we need to target the money to the people most in need. No use giving money to people that are already working, already have income, and just adding to the size of their savings account is what happened with some of the people. So we need to focus the need where it's really going to do the most good and not just money that's going to be spent in two or three or four years. And in fact, the economy is doing very well now and I think is ready to take off regardless of this in another two to three months. I, I want to switch topics if I can. I, I mentioned Josh Mandel. He and Jane Timken, the former Republican chair, are really the only two declared candidates for the uh, Senate race, but uh, we can expect Lou on both sides, can't we? There are going to be a lot more people jumping into that U.S. Senate race. It's going to be a very crowded field. It just underscores the division within the Republican Party and folks sort of clamoring to, to follow in Donald Trump's footsteps. Uh, obviously, as Democrats, we're hopeful for a messy Republican primary, I think would create an <laughs> opportunity for a Democrat. Uh, you know, I'm close to Tim Ryan. We've talked about his prospective candidacy. Uh, others are also talking about it. But look, I think back to what Terry was talking about, I think this American Rescue Package is very important. We have to have relief right now. And I think Republicans are going against something that's very popular. I mean, the American people want this relief package. It's critical to contain the pandemic and also get money in the, in the hands of Americans. I think President Biden's doing a masterful job managing both the progressive wing and the moderate wing of the party. So I'm optimistic something will get done, hopefully before that March 14th deadline. And Lou touched on the, the infighting in your party, Terry. There really is this establishment Republican and Trump Republican. So as we look at that Senate race, who do you think is going to prevail, the Trump side or the establishment side? Well, my prediction is the candidate with the most votes is going to win. There could be <laughs> five to eight major candidates, including three more multimillionaires to get in it, and maybe two or three more members of Congress. So 32% might win that primary. But the good news on our side, we've got some candidates with political base and name ID. And yeah, Tim Ryan has talked for the 14th time about running statewide or running for president, but the Democrats are rather short on candidates that have any kind of uh, real credentials or name ID out there in this challenging state. Well, uh, we are just about out of time, but I, I, I like that you say the candidate with the most votes wins, but isn't there also a chance that the candidate with the most money wins. I mean, uh, well, there's a lot of money that's going to be in this race. Don't you both think? This will think? be a national race, and I think Democrats will certainly have a viable candidate and be ready to compete in Ohio. Um, Senator Brown has been successful. I think we can replicate that model. And I'm, I'm hopeful for a Republican, tough Republican primary, which I think could alienate a lot of voters in, in the middle. All right. I, I thank yeah. both of you. We are out of time, but thank you both. And I'm sure we'll be talking about this in the weeks ahead. Absolutely. And we will be right back. 
Ohio's top elected officials are more than halfway through their terms, and they've all faced the same issue in very different ways. Starting next week on the Spectrum, we'll begin to see my one-on-one -on -one interviews with the state's leaders on powering through the pandemic. We'll see you back here next Sunday on the Spectrum.